OK, so that better? Is it better? OK. So uh, hi, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk uh, about this uh, research project, which uh, involves not only EDAP, uh, where I am working, but also uh, several institutes in, in Europe, so two from France, in Rian CNRS, uh, the University of Potsdam, the Technical University of Prague, and we have our two uh, funding sources, so the European uh, Seventh Framework Program and the Swiss uh, Science Foundation. So I will first go through the motivation behind the project, and then I will give you uh, a quick overview of where we are now and, uh, and how you can be involved uh, if you are interested. So the, the motivation for the project was that uh, it, it's pretty obvious that um, any uh, biological system able to learn and able to, to do processing is, uh, is complex. So if you take, for instance, this is a, a summary of multi, uh, multiple publications about the, the in, uh, connections in the macaque brain. And basically, any little square stands for an area in the, in the, in the brain. And, and those, those are the connections that have been traced uh, through, through the years. And if you compare this to any uh, machine learning algorithm, so I'm, 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 re I'm more into computer vision, but most of the algorithm, even state of the art, uh, can be described pretty quickly. So you can, it, it's, they are usually developed by a really small team, uh, two or three people, and even the, the best ones can be described to a graduate student that could re-implement them in a matter of, of days or, or, or weeks. So the complexity of uh, artificial learning systems is is pretty low in some sense compared to, to what uh, biology uh, shows us. From a practical perspective, there has been multiple examples that by combining multiple recipes, multiple machine learning recipes, and trying to make more complex machinery by combining things done by different people, you systematically improve the performance of your prediction. So a, a really uh, a visible example was uh, a Netflix challenge which was one into, so the Netflix challenge, for those of you who are not aware, was the goal was to predict uh, what movies people like. So you would have a, a string data, the, the history of uh, uh, movies people have rent on Netflix and how they rated them, and then you would try to predict what, some, what, what movie somebody would like if he has liked this and this and this. And the prize was won by uh, a team which combined the prediction for multiple teams. So at the end, the, the, successful, the most success, successful strategy was to use an, an expert voting uh, with algorithms designed by teams which were basically independent, so by different people with their different take on the, on the problem. And this is observed again and again, especially in vision, for instance. So those are results from, for flower classification. This is a paper from ICCV 2009. And so I'm going to, who is familiar with image features? Who know what an image feature is? OK, I'm, I'm going to do like when I teach. Who is not familiar with image features? OK, so 80% of people have no opinion. Uh, so, so basically, the idea of uh, machine learning for computer vision usually uh, rely on image features, which are uh, measurements you, you, you are going to make on the image. So this could be, for instance, edge detectors, uh, color histograms, uh, Fourier transform. Uh, uh, there, there are plenty of ways you could even do segmentation and then measure things on, on the image which has been segmented. So in that case, this, this paper was showing the performance for classification when you use a certain type of, of feature. So based on color, shape, texture, uh, histogram of uh, oriented gradient, uh, sift, etc. And you see that this is the accuracy. So roughly around 65, 70%. And on the right, you have the accuracy you reach if you combine all those features, so instead of basing uh, your predictor only on one family of features, you are going to, to build several predictors and combine, combine all of them. And those are different m ways of combining them. And you see that the accuracy jumps from, let's say, 65 to 85%. So this is the first uh, uh, interesting result. And the second one is that the way you combine them does not matter, uh, matter much. So it always stays around uh, 85%. And we have done in, in, in our projects and in many situations the same kind of experiment. So we have uh, multiple families of feature extractors. And here this is a standard uh, image uh, classification database, pedestrians versus background. So you have uh, hundreds of images of, of pedestrians which have been cropped into natural images and hundreds of images of background, so places where there are no pedestrians. 
and you just try to build, so I, I don't remember the exact setting, but it, it was probably with Adabus, you just try to build a predictor that will respond positively if you give as input a, an image of a pedestrian and that would respond negatively if you give a background image. And if we try, so we, we, we built 19 predictors using each one using one family of, one family of features, this is the best error rate we, we can obtain. So this is the number of weak learners. So let's say roughly 1%. This was a, and now if we run the exact same algorithm, but instead of taking the best family of features, we use all of them and we let the machine learning uh, mix them uh, how, it, it, seems, uh, how we, it, it thinks it's, it's uh, the most efficient, we can divide this error rate by three. Another uh, series of experiments we did was, so we designed uh, for another project, actually, uh, a series of 23 pattern recognition problems. And so we call this synthetic, synthetic visual reasoning test. So each one of these problems, uh, uh, for each one of these problems, we have two uh, algorithmic procedures a, that allows us to produce as many samples as we want. So those are binary images of resolution uh, 128 by 128. And each problem has a, an underlying rule. So for instance, for this one, uh, the positive class for the positive class, you have two shapes, two, two identical shapes located uh, unif uh, at, at, at posi position t uh, sample at random uniformly in the image, while in the negative cl class in the same thing, but the two shapes are different. For this one, you have one big shape and one small shape in the positive class. The small shape is inside the big and in the negative class it's outside, etc. So, and so those problems involve high level kind of description. The way I describe it, uh, the way I describe those problems were not, I, I did not say, okay, you, you have more black pixels in one corner and it's uh, more edges in this other corner. It, it requires a high level description. But still we can try to, to train uh, a, a basic two class predictors, again with boosting and again using the same 19 families of features. And I will come back to this and just try to look at the, at the error rate. So what we did, what this graph shows, we have divided the features we use in three groups. So the first one are just features that count a uh, number of black pixels in re rectangular areas uh, sample at random. So for instance, you would have 1,000 uh, features. Each one is associated to a certain rectangle and the value of the feature given certain image is the number of pixel, black pixels in this area. And if you use this feature vector of 1,000 dimension and you boost with it, this is, uh, so here you have one line for every problem. You have 20, 23 lines. And this, those are the error rates you reach when you use uh, this, this feature set. In the second feature, uh, family, uh, group of features, we add edge-like uh, features. So uh, either the, the hug, so um, basically you, you, you compute the, the gradient of the image and then you do some processing. And we, we have plenty of, of ways of, of computing edges. And you see that if the error rate, for instance, of this problem was 48% or so, when you use only counting pixels in rectangular areas, it drops to 23 or 24%. And then we add, in the third uh, group of features, we add uh, Fourier-like uh, features. So how wavelets, Fourier transform, and these kind of things. And you see that for some problems, just increasing, so we keep the learning uh, process, the learning algorithm exactly the same, just increasing the complexity of the family of features. We, for some problems, it goes from 45 to 20 to basically zero, virtually, uh, no mistake. Uh, the color just corresponds to the three, group, three groups of, of problems according to the best error rate we reach. So the blue are the difficult ones, the green are the medium one, and the red are the easy one when you, we use all the features. Okay, so the moral of this graph is simply that more features better. Uh, it's simply, and, and it's something we really see, you, you, you can see that sometime, in some rare case, the error rate increases a bit because you have an overfitting that kicks in. If you increase the feature, the, the, the dimension of the feature vector, you allow the system to overfit because it's more, more powerful in the, in the uh, functional space. It, it, has, it can create more, more uh, separation of the data. Okay, so in practice, combining the different modalities of prediction method is very efficient. So it, it's something, if you ever have to uh, solve a practical problem before doing sophisticated theoretical things, or, if, or maybe after, uh, increasing the number, the, the quantity of features or the number of uh, methods you combine uh, will always basically increase the performance. So different modalities tend to catch complementary information. So in vision, it's obvious that if you do, for instance, face versus non-face classification and you have looked at edges, 
and you have reached a certain performance level with uh, edge detectors, putting now color in the story and allowing the learning system to look at color will, of course, increase the performance of the system because color and edges tend to be uh, somehow decorrelated de to some extent. So if you, use, uh, if you use only edges, you will end up with difficult uh, faces which have, for instance, blurry image where the edges are not here. Color may, be, may exist. On the other hand, if you have relied on color, you, may, you, you will end up with mistakes for faces where the lighting is completely crazy and the face has, does not have a regular skin color, and the edges may allow you to catch this. Different prediction methods tend to be wrong differently. So it's something which is, which is at the core of uh, the bagging uh, strategies with the decision trees or with uh, predictors in general. But it, 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 it's, even, it's, even, uh, it's, it's even more true if those methods are really not only random, it's not only the same method which has been randomized during learning, but there are really different methods developed by different people. It's exactly like in engineering. If you want really, if you really have a critical piece of, uh, of uh, technology, for instance, brakes in a plane, you will tend, and it's something which is actually done, you will tend to have redundant systems designed by different teams of engineers that don't take to talk to each other, on which, uh, at least for the French military, they would hire engineers which have not been in the same schools to be sure that if they make a mistake in one group, the mistake is uh, likely not in the other. So at the end, if you combine independent, if you combine either complement, complementary features or different uh, predictors, you combine independent variables. And at the end, you have the, the law of large number that kicks in and, and the prediction will get better. So, Complex learning systems are worth investigating. The, the, the idea of trying to design, to have this idea in mind from the beginning, the tr to, to say this is what we want to do. We want to do a complex system that has a lot of modules designed by different people and, and interact together. So maybe we should envision uh, the, the, the design of machine learning software as a, a mega project. So really to think about how can we have hundreds of people working together to do it? So instead of being uh, three persons in front of a whiteboard trying to find a nice formula, trying to think about a way of having 200 or 500 or 1,000 people solving little pieces and then you put all this together and you, you obtain something that works better. So unfortunately, uh, development of machine learning software involves specific engineering difficulties. So what is usually, what, what are the procedures and the, the ways of doing uh, this uh, collaborative work in standard engineering uh, cannot be applied directly to machine learning. So the first thing is that the, the specifications of what those sub-modules should do involve a very complex object, which is uh, the, the nature of the world, the, the data set uh, in the case of uh, uh, standard prediction or in the case of goal planning on, on robotic, uh, real-world, uh, partially observable Markov decision process. So, while in engineering you could say, uh, I want you to design this uh, sub part of this engine and it has to, to work for this tolerance in temperature, this tolerance in strength, and this tolerance in acceleration, and, and this and that. For machine learning, it's far harder. You, it's hard to, to tell somebody, okay, I want you to design this edge detector, and then what? Uh, that work, that's going to work well when I put it in my neural network, or when, that's going to work well when I put it in. So, you can, to some extent, give a specification. You can say, I would, it, I, I, I would like it to be invariant to illumination, to change in illumination, invariant to rotation, or whatever. But any specification you give will, will involve this complex uh, confrontation to the, to, to the data, to the, to the experimental uh, uh, behavior. We have a limited understanding of machine, of machine learning algorithm beyond rough behavior. So we, we often have results about convergence. We know that things are going to go down. On, on, on the area. We know we have results about overfitting. So we know that if you increase this, overfitting goes up. If you increase that, overfitting goes down. But, and you, you, also, you often have a good understanding of the cost uh, because this is standard algorithmic. Usually you know how, how much a CPU is going to be used. And, you have some ideas about some invariants. So especially in computer vision, you can design typically edge detectors. You know that if you apply a monotonic transformation of the gray level, the edges won't, won't change. You know that for a certain form of histograms, if you rotate the image, it won't change. But that's basically it. What is probably the 
the most confusing thing in, in, in machine learning when you apply it, apply it to the real world is that the resulting algorithm combines very large number of simple cues, but the emerging behavior is of different nature. So again, you, you may, if you take, for instance, the hog, so the hog is a kind of feature that just computes the proportion of edges in, in, in little blocks. So it, it just looks at how many edges are in, 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 in angular uh, sectors. It's, it's, it's trivial to describe. You can say, yes, it's simply uh, how much I have an edges in that direction at that location. But the problem is that if you boost, if you, if you use boosting and you build stumps from those features, and th at the end you have a, a, a classifier that combines 10,000 of those things on the emerging behavior has strictly nothing to do with the features themselves. So even if you have some reasoning about the features, you'd say, okay, it's invariant, it's good. Uh, the, the behavior of the resulting system is a, a totally different nature. And at the end, we often have uh, no idea why, why it truly works. So people will come with plenty of arguments and say, yeah, I did this, it works well because of that. But if you do it in practice, you realize that often um, buggy code sometimes works as well. So on, on this, for instance, for edge detectors, so I designed a few years ago, a cat detector, uh, and for which we had really nifty uh, edge detectors. And the justif we had a really nice justif intellectual justification for those edges. So it was a ratio of the number of pixels to what the edges divided by the number of pixels where the variance greater than whatever. It was, it was working beautifully. After six months, I realized that actually I was not dividing by the number of pixels who had a, a gray level, local gray level variance greater than something, but I was dividing by something totally different which has nothing to do whatsoever with, with what you wanted to do. Well, it, was, it was working as well. I fixed the bug uh, and the performance just remained exactly the same. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but maybe it was because the rest was really well done. Uh, okay, so in practice, uh, developing a machine learning based method for, uh, for application is, a, is more of a meta learning algorithm. So developers, so, or researchers, uh, whatever, go back and forth between identifying mistakes. So this is a kind of a, a, a fictitious scenario if you are making a face detector. So you, you build your face detector, it works well, then you start to try it on pictures where there are trees, and trees will make all the face detectors in the world trigger because they have a lot of edges, so the face detector freaks out. So you say, okay, well, I'm going to fix this. So I'm going to add features to detect where you are, when you have patches of high frequencies. And then you realize that maybe you don't detect bald people anymore. So you are going to add features to pick on this shape. And now you are going to realize that it's overfit. So you are going to add a L1 penalty in your algorithm to just uh, force the uh, limit the overfitting. So in some sense, this is similar to boosting or SVM. So at any moment, you have you the developer or the meta algorithm you look at what are the worst cases, the worst failure of your algorithm, and you go back to the computer and you fix it. So you kind of do, if, if you are really gradient descent, you would just do one step in the good direction to make things better. So, and, and this is not, by, by no means this is, a, this is, this is supposed to be a, a demonizing for the, for the human. So human are super optimizers, seeing a bit more than the gradient. So, uh, you, you optimize, you go back and forth between the data on your program, and you just try to, to make it work on your, on your data. And, and if you are a really good researcher, you will always have a, a, a test set that you never look at uh, until one week before the conference, and then you try your algorithm on this one, this is what you publish. If you don't do this, uh, you, are, you are cheating a bit. Okay, so all this is the motivation for the, for this, uh, the, MASH, the MASH project. Uh, so, the first observation that machine learning lacks tools to rationalize uh, the design of very complex architectures. And, and, and really, I mean it. There are no tools to do this. Uh, there are plenty of tools to, to, plenty of tools, statistical tools to look at your data, but really tools that allows to build something, uh, uh, very complex architectures, there is nothing except standard, maybe software development tools. Also, combining multiple feature extractor and prediction methods improve performances. And internet-based collaborative tools allow large human individuals to work together. So this is something obvious. I mean, open source, uh, Linux, Firefox, uh, etc. So the goal of the project was, was to create new tools to design complex learning systems in a collaborative manner. So what we focus on is uh, just the design of feature extractors. So uh, this is an image of a, we have a, a sort of a 3D game because half of the applications uh, 
uh, is about goal planning. I'm not going to talk much about this today, but this is something we have, uh, we have in the back of our mind. So we are focusing on this kind of architectures. You have a signal input, which is an image. You have a bunch of feature extractor, uh, feature extra extractors, each of them computing a feature vector. And then you combine all those feature vectors, and you feed it to a predictor, which are, you are going to train, and you make a prediction. Okay. And the idea is to design a web platform. So this web platform contains both the feature extractors and the different predictors we, we can use on the application. So the consortium members, the researchers, which are directly part of the, of the project, can design these, those things on the, on the, on the, choose, choose the application, while external contributors, and I'm going to come back to this, uh, can design feature extractors and, and put them in the system. On the platform, so this web platform also includes uh, standard communication tools uh, at a web 2.0, so uh, forum, private message, wiki, etc. And I will also say a bit about the, the idea of mining tools. But uh, bottom line, we want to design a web platform where people can submit implementations of feature extractors in C++, and those feature extractors are going to be combined in a machine learning, large-scale machine learning experiment. So we will have two big families of applications. The first one is standard image classification. So we have a bunch of data, standard data set in the platform at the moment. So uh, this, this is an, a few of them, but we have more than that. So this is MNIST. Uh, this is a data set of 60,000 uh, unwritten digits of small resolution, something like 2222 or 2828. This is uh, some example of the INRIA pedestrian data set. This is Caltech 256. So this is a data set with 256 objects, and you have something like uh, 100 images of each. And this is a CIFAR 10 data set, and I will come back to this because we are, we are starting a contest with this. Uh, this is a data set of 50,000 images, 10 classes, so 5,000 images of each class, and the, the image of our resolution 3232, and this is color. And we also, so this already works, but it's not deployed uh, to the, to the external, uh, external to the consortium. Uh, one is a 3D simulator, so it's based on a, an open source, uh, may probably no, not Quake, but this kind of uh, renderer, uh, where you, so you can move uh, forward, left, right, and you, are, you have some goal to, to achieve, for instance, reach the flag or stuff like that. And we also have a real physical robot that we can control the same way uh, to do goal planning, so we have a few tasks. Okay, so the, the project objectives are, are to uh, create tools to help the collaborative development of large family of feature extractors. So the open platform I just described, and also metric on clustering algorithms to, to give uh, a synthetic uh, summary of what has already been uh, developed by people. So uh, if you come with a good idea of an edge detector, you could submit your feature extractor and the platform would be able to tell you Okay, there are five, five, five other contributors already submitted something similar. You should talk to them. Those are their names. We want to develop machine learning methods to use them. And here we face the standard issues in very large dimensions. So we used uh, drastic uh, regularization not to overfit. And also, and, uh, I, I may say a word, but uh, we, we, there are computational issues because if you think about uh, even 30 feature extractors, each of them producing thousands of features, just doing a proper job in boosting with them, for instance, already takes, may take days or weeks of training. So there are algorithmic issues. And, and finally, we want to measure performance of those methods on uh, image classification and goal planning. And, uh, yeah, and finally, w w what we want to achieve at the end is to deliver to the community. So this uh, platform, so under an open source license, open source reference implementations of both the algorithm with the researcher in the project and the, the feature extractors the contributor will, will produce on data sets because uh, either using the robot we have or, or, or doing, this, uh, doing the data sets ourselves, we will produce a few uh, over the course of the project. On the long term, the long term goal of the project would be ideally to create uh, a field of feature extractor mining. So to give tools to people to, to get a view and an understanding of this gigantic space of feature extractors and to know where it's interesting to go for a certain application, where what has been already exhausted and what should be uh, the, the, the region where we should look at. 
At the core of the project, we have defined the notion of an heuristic. So heuristic is simply a feature extractor with a persistent state. The persistent state is for the goal planning. We want to put some memory in, in, the, in, the, in the story so that we can deal with a partially observable Markov decision process. So uh, a heuristic is simply an algorithm which is able, if, if you have a sequence of image, and I, am in a, I, I can specify a certain image, a certain, a certain scale in the image, a certain location in the image, and it will just compute a feature vector. So the heuristic defines what is its, its dimension. So you could imagine a really simple one, which would have dimension one, and just compute the average of the, in, the uh, intensity of the pixels in this uh, area. So this definition can be applied to multiple contexts. So one is uh, image classification, where we, we just compute this feature vector for each heuristic uh, for a scale which encompasses all the image and uh, at the center of the image. For detection, so for people not familiar with de uh, uh, object detection, one of the most uh, simple way of applying your machine learning method of choice to uh, object detection is so-called uh, sliding window. So you just visit the image at, multi at every position or at every scale, and you ask your, your two-class classifier, for instance, is there a car, is there a car, is there a car, is there a car, and every time the classifier says yes, you know you have a so to do, to do this, you must be able to compute your features at different locations or for different size. And finally, for goal planning, uh, it's exactly the same thing, but now we can also uh, rely on the, uh, on the persistence. Uh, so for instance, if, if you have a task, and, and the task is to, uh, let's say you, you know that you have, uh, you have two flags, uh, you have three flags, two of a certain color and one of another color, and you, want, you know that your goal is to reach the single one, the unique one, uh, you could build a, uh, a heuristic that would, as soon as it's three, three, three blobs of color at the same time in the field of view, memorize that now what is the target, the target is the one which is unique. So the persistent state allows you to have information, uh, to keep information in, in, in time. Okay, so this is what it looks like, actually. This is what a heuristic is. It's simply a, 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 a class that implements all those methods, so that inheres from heuristic and implements those guys. Actually, not all those. The only one that you truly have to implement is DIM, that tells the dimensions, the number of uh, features this, uh, this heuristic is going to compute, and compute features. So uh, when we call compute feature, you actually have uh, uh, data fields in the class which contain the location, the image, the pointer to the image, and stuff like that. And, if, and, and so we, you would get an, in, an index which is between zero and dim minus one, and you have to return the value. So we provide on, on, the, on, the, mash, on the project platform a multi-platform standard uh, software development kit, which works on Linux, Mac OS D, the 10, and the Windows. And we also give, in this uh, SDK, all the tools to test heuristic locally. So you can download the, the, the kit and compile and run some sanity check on your, on your computer. So this is the life cycle of, of a heuristic. So we first code call init, and then we are going to go through sequences of images. We will call prepare for sequence. That tells your heuristic, OK, if you want to, to reset your memory, this is now. Then we are going to loop through all the images in the sequence. When we start from any, for any image, we are going to call prepare for image. So this is where you would, for instance, do pre-computation. So the, the basic example of the, the value of pre-computation is for the so-called Haar wavelets. So the Haar wavelets are based uh, so the Haar wavelets are based on, on summing the value of pixels in rectangular areas. So summing the, number, the value of pixels in rectangular areas, a naive strategy would be big O of, would be the computational cost would be proportional to the size of the rectangle because you would have a loop in X and a loop in Y. But the, the thing is that if you know you are going to compute gazillions of those guys, you, you can do it far, far more efficiently. What you do is to compute what is called an integral image beforehand. So you start from your original image and then you compute a new image. Each pixel on this new image is the sum of all the pixels in the previous one between the left corner and this pixel. And this can be done as constant time because you do it incrementally. And now if you have to compute the sum of the pixel in a certain rectangle, you just take your integral image and you take <coughs> this value here, plus this value here, minus here, minus here. Just look at it with a pencil on a piece of paper, it's fantastic. So you would do this here, you would compute your integral image here, and now we are going to loop through some certain locations if you want to do even more pre-computation, you can do, do them here. 
and then we are going to compute some index. Uh, so the, the idea of this multiple methods in the class is just to allow you to organize your computation more uh, in, a, in a more intelligent manner so that you are more cost efficient. So we, we can see a little example to make things more concrete. So this is uh, the identity. The identity would be a heuristic that just returns a, a feature vector which is of the size of the region of interest, so this little uh, square, and which uh, uh, just returns one, one feature for every pixel, and it's, it's actually the value of the pixel. So we are going to implement only two methods, the dimension on the, on the actual computation of the features. So the, the dimension is simply, the, so, so this is a constant. So the multi-scale is not done at the heuristic level. It's done at the, at the framework level. So you are, your feature extractors will always can be ensured that uh, you, the, this, this value will, ne will not change. Uh, the value it had when, you, when we called dimension will be always the same all the time. So this is just the number of pixels in the region of interest. And then to compute the actual features, we just uh, uh, look at the, what is the location where uh, of the region of interest, so this, which is given by coordinates x and coordinates y. We compute the location of the left, uh, upper left corner of the region of interest by uh, subtracting the region of interest extent. Then the index of the feature gives us the, the coordinate of, the, of a pixel in this region of interest, and we just return this guy. Okay? So it's extremely simple. So technical issues, uh, we don't trust people because people are mean and the world is full of hackers. So the problem is that we are going to, to uh, run uh, binary codes compiled on all computers of code of people uh, we don't know. So this, uh, this involves uh, certain technical, technical issues. So the first one is that even if people are nice, uh, usually their code crash and some people are not nice. So we had to design uh, what is called a sandbox environment. So basically when we run this uh, heuristic code, it's run in a, in a, in a uh, secured environment. So that when it crashes, there is no issue. And especially we have a time budget for every operation. So each time we, we call one of your methods, we credit your, your heuristic with a, a certain amount of time in milliseconds. And when your you exhaust this time budget, we kill the heuristic and we, we deal with it like if it has crashed. So this is uh, something you, you are not allowed to do. So on, on to allow you to, so we, we index some of the budget with the image surface of or the region of interest surface. So somebody made recently a comment that we should be in N log N because at least he wanted to sort his pixels. So maybe we will make this proportional to the image surface times the log of the image surface uh, so he, that he can do it. OK. So the platform is already operational. So if you go, if you go there, uh, you can see it. Uh, so contributors, anybody interested can create a, a user account. So you can log on it, uh, just uh, create an account. And, and then you can upload as many heuristic as, as you want. Uh, the platform will first test that those heuristics compile so that uh, they, they, can be, uh, they can be run on the, on the platform. It will run a few experiments to evaluate their performance and it will rank them. So if you do, it, if you do this right now, so first you will see there is a list of all the heuristics people have already uh, contributed, mostly us. And you can submit yours and it will be run on a few small, small scale experiments and you will get uh, an error rate and, and it will be ranked against the other. So each heuristic can be either private, in which case the source remains undisclosed. So it's in your, in your private on, uh, space on the platform and you, you, nobody sees them, but you can, only, uh, you can run only small scale experiments. And you can at any moment decide to make your code public, in which case you give us the, the right to use it under the GPL version 2. You can still ask for the source to remain uh, hidden for up to four weeks. So you can, you, you, you can still already be public. So and when you, your heuristic is public, then uh, it's, it's enrolled in large scale experiments and you may participate to contests. And also, so you can keep, it, uh, you can keep the source hidden for four weeks so that you could, you could be the best in the contest and still people would not know how you did it. So they would not be able to download your stuff fix it a bit, re-upload it, and gain 1% error rate on, on BTU. 
So this is what it looks like. So in that case, uh, we see a heuristic. So each of them has an author, a name, a short description on the uh, number of versions time when it was uh, uploaded in the system. So this is what looks like your own uh, heuristic list. So those are the private heuristics. So for each of them, you can, uh, you can decide to make it public. So we, we need some legalist stuff uh, when you upload some things to, so that you, you tell us we can do what we want to do with it. The system, so when you uh, upload a heuristic, the system is going to check that uh, so your code compiled and can be, uh, and can be used. You can schedule and run experiments yourself. So this is what experiments look like. So for each of them, you, it, it can be, so we have goal planning and classification. This is classification. You have the name of the data set, uh, who ran it, and what was the, no, what was the predictor used. So in that case, this, it's a basic Adaboost uh, predictor. And then you have zero rate. So uh, yeah, this is what uh, an experiment looks like. So if you want to schedule an experiment yourself, so when you have created an account on, on the uh, uploaded heuristic, you can run your own experiment on, on, on our platform. Uh, so you can pick what type. So right now, uh, on the public one, I'm not sure. You, you, you could check, but mainly it's classification. You can pick a data set, pick the classes you want to look you to look at uh, on different parameters in the experiment. You can choose what, uh, which one of your heuristics you want to use, which one of the heuristics of other people you want to use, and then you can run the, the experiment and you will get a nice uh, uh, experimental results uh, about the performance. So this is, for instance, so this one is on the CIFAR data set, which is extremely difficult data set. The rate without, additional, uh, without training on additional data is around 30%. And this is interesting because it, it shows you which features was, was used uh, by the boosting uh, after 10,000 stumps. And what is a bit depressing is that basically, so Fourier does well, but Hog does very well. So it's Hog, Hog, and Hog again. Variants of Hog are really, really excellent. There are tools that, that we, co we call instruments. Uh, we can extremely easily add probes uh, in the classifiers or during, both during learning and during tests to record information about uh, both the training and the test. And then we can uh, plot a synthetic summary of the experimental results. So in that case, this is the correct classification rate on the CIFAR data set. So as you can see, CAT are difficult. We can also plot a version of the confusion matrix. So you pick a true class and then it tells you what is the distribution over uh, the wrong classes. So what is interesting is that <laughs> it's a bit vexing, I guess, for cats, but 35% uh, of the, well, among the wrong, the, the wrong classified ones, 34% of them were classified as dogs, then bird, deer, and frog. So it's something interesting. It's only animals, and even horse. And then you have airplane strikes and shit. You also have a list of the worst mistakes of the classifiers. So it's interesting because it's basically by looking at this that you could come with a new idea of features, you could look at that and say, okay, definitely the color would help, or looking at the color in this area would help. On here, so I, I, I have only extremely preliminary results on this, but this is the clustering of the heuristic. So basically what we do is to compute the, to take the families of, uh, of uh, so the heuristics, the families of features, and to take examples in one of the data set, and then we can do clustering by looking at the feature vector and compare heuristics on this ba based on this uh, clustering. And here what you see is that, uh, well, okay, there are gra graphical uh, displays maybe more. W what is interesting is that the, the, the similar features, really similar in the sense of what they do, algorithmically, so the edges would go together. So for instance, ZK, chamfer ZK, hog on, on hog blurred, are really similar kind of features. They really do uh, edge detection on the histograms of edge detections. And so here it's a projection in 2D to keep the, the, the distance uh, as, as, uh, as correct as possible. So you see that the, the, the edges goes together. Then you have uh, of transform, closer pixel, further pixel, which are also similar. You have Fourier close to Har. So th this is really interesting because if you, if you Upload a new uh, feature extractor, you can either see that you are really, really uh, or an original person because you end up here, or you can see that you do something similar to something which has already been done and check at 
how uh, this, one done, this was done by other. So the overall interaction we expect uh, between people on the platform would be that to, to first look at the, everything, the existing heuristic in the system and how they perform. Then to improve an, uh, an existing heuristic or write one from scratch. So you can download the source code from all the ones already uh, in the system. Upload it on, on test that it works. Run additional private experiments. So just to see if uh, you are going to be ridiculous or not if, if you make it public. Then make it public if it is satisfying. And if you if you're interested, you can even register into contests. And I will end with uh, I, I talk with this uh, the idea of contest. And we have also public experiments that we define, uh, which run continuously with all the available public heuristics. So we have large scale experiments that use everything uh, just to see if we improve the, the state of the art uh, just by doing this, by taking a lot of uh, features. Okay, so we recently started a three tracks heuristic design contest. So the protocol for each track is similar. What we did, so, the, so this, is, this is a complex problem to design a, a satisfying contest because you want the contest to be satisfying for uh, contributors. So they are, really have the feeling that they are really improved something and, and they are competing with features which have been designed by people from computer vision for 25 years. So coming with a new idea is not obvious. But you want also the contest to really improve the state of the art. You really want to do better than what has been done before. Otherwise, uh, it, it's, it's pretty uh, useless. So what we did was to pre-train. So for each one of these tracks, we pre-trained a strong classifier with n stump using Adaboost and using all the heuristics we have already uh, implemented. And then for each participating heuristic, so each heuristic submitted by somebody, we run m additional stumps using the, that heuristic alone. So what's going to happen that if this heuristic is really similar to the ones already in the system, uh, it, it won't improve anything. So if you just download one and, and uh, <coughs> call it with a new name, put it in the system, uh, the stumps added with yours will not do better. We will, have, will be in the area where it's, uh, it's saturated, so it, it does not help. And the final performance is a reduction of the test error. How much your M additional stump with your heuristic alone has improved the performance that you re reached with N stumps with all the heuristic. And so the data set we use is CIFAR10, this, dat this database of small color images. And we have the three tracks of the contest correspond to uh, a strong classifier with no stump. So in that case, we just build one with yours, with your heuristic. A strong classifier with 100 stumps and a strong classifier with 10,000 stumps. And we add 100 stamps with a new, uh, with a contributor heuristic. So this is ideally what it looks like. So this is the number of stamps. We first have a bunch of stamps with a heuristic already in the system. The test error rate will go down. And then we, we boost an, another 100 stamps with your heuristic alone. And hopefully it will help again. So for instance, imagine that here we have only edge, de edge detectors. And suddenly you add color the boosting would have a little uh, infection point because uh, a, a little uh, rupture in the, in the slope because suddenly it can do really better. <coughs> At the end of each month, we will pick the best heuristic and add it to the pool of the heuristics we use to train the strong classifiers uh, so that it will ensure that the optimal modalities will, will move around. So we, we, we may exploit, uh, I don't know, Fourier transform for a while, and after a while it will be completely uh, exhausted because now we have a bunch of heuristics based on this, and it will uh, push uh, contributors to move to other modalities. And also there is a critical issue, which is the design overfitting, because people can be extremely aggressive. You could, I should, maybe should not do this, but you could cheat by uh, just putting a hash table with all the test images, and, and that would work beautifully. So we have kept a part of the CIFAR training set as a validation set, which basically allows people who want really to, to cheat, still to cheat. But we, we, if there is a fantastic heuristic, we'll, we'll scrutinize the source code carefully to, to be sure people are not doing this. Okay, so the future of the project, uh, there, are, there are many things in progress. So the platform is still young and there are uh, many things we are still developing. So the first thing will be a contest in goal planning. So instead of doing image classification to try. So it will probably be something called uh, iterated Q-fitting, uh, uh, yes, which consists of trying to, to, to build, to build a, a 
a predictor of the Q value. So I don't know if you're familiar with goal planning, but basically it's, it's, it's extremely, it's related, strongly related to regression in the sense that you can do it uh, offline. So you, you, you would call, we would collect a bunch of images with, uh, with a robot or with a simulator, the 3D simulator. And then we could use features simply to try to learn the, the Q value. So the value of actions in any state. Uh, we want to uh, deploy new prediction algorithms. So we have a bunch of them which are not in the platform now, like uh, Lasso and others, but they are already ready. And we have also uh, implemented so feature selection and, and new boosting. So we, we have b beautiful boosting algorithms, but they are uh, under review in, we, on, with anonymity. I don't know how much we can speak about this, but uh, basically we have uh, say, uh, at least two, two new kind of uh, so we have looked uh, at IDAP at ways of bia uh, inducing bias in the sampling of the feature. So when you do boosting the, in, in the most uh, standard version, you, you, at every step, at every uh, uh, boosting iteration, you go through all the features, and if you do stump, you go through all the features and pick the best. To reduce the computational cost, a, st uh, a standard strategy consists of sampling the features. So instead of looking at all your features, you just say, okay, I'm going to sample 100 of them and pick the best. But in that case, when you have multiple families of heuristics, it's obvious that if one of them has been bad for the last 1,000 iterations, maybe you should just give up on instead of sampling this guy, not sampling it and sampling another one twice, twice more. And so we have developed several strategies to do exactly this. So uh, we have an algorithm called tasting that consists of sampling a really small number of features beforehand, uh, having them in cache. So this can be, we can reuse them quickly. And at every iteration of boosting, we first use those guys to have a quick estimate of how each family would behave. And then we sample intensively uh, the best one. And this works really, really well. This works uh, far, far better than, uh, than uh, simply, uh, simply sampling uniformly. So, uh, we want to deploy, so we already have them, but it's not on the platform, the heuristic clustering tools. So those, are those tools that shows you the little um, plot. We want to, to add uh, some features on the platform to allow, uh, to allow people to use it for education, so to teach uh, machine learning or signal processing or computer vision. So the idea would be that contributors could have a boss that look at uh, their contribution. And we also are looking for new application domains. This is more... Uh, uh, long term, but this is definitely something we want to move on. So we are looking for collaboration. So the first form of collaboration we are interested in is, of course, a contributing heuristic. So uh, you are more than welcome. If you have any idea of some revolutionary edge detector, please uh, do it. Uh, and also we are looking for other researchers so, uh, that could join us uh, at the level of the, the defining the prediction method on the application. So to deploy, so your own open source predictor. So we are pretty adamant on this because uh, first for ideological reasons and also because we have made promise to our European uh, overlords that everything would be uh, open source. Uh, you, you could also uh, have your own publicly available again databases and also so, uh, look at new application domain. And any ID suggestion is welcome. Uh, we have a paper, a four-page paper, so it's pretty synthetic, that was just accepted at TCML, uh, and it's, you can already get the, maybe not yet, the PDF on my page, but in the next days, that should be the case. And on that, basically, it, and we should have uh, papers soon in other conferences about uh, or fast boosting. Thank you for your attention. Yes. Yeah, I, I um, do work on something similar to that sort of image segmentation problem, and I've seen that for tasks like segmentation and recognition, they use the or they usually use like MATLAB and OpenCV. Yeah. I heard you mention that most of the coders have code in C and C++, but um, do they also use OpenCV library, or do you want to like start from scratch? So, I do, so yeah, that's a question many people ask. So the, the more larger, so there are two keywords in what you say, libraries on MATLAB. So first libraries. So uh, we are I don't know exactly what the status, but definitely if anybody need OpenCV and just drop us a mail, we would add OpenCV uh, in the platform. It's maybe probably the, already the case. Uh, now MATLAB, uh, it's a big no, because MATLAB is, uh, well, whatever, it's not open source. So yeah. 
And then other languages, the problem is more uh, the time it takes to make wrappers for us. So we looked a bit at ways of uh, uh, putting Octave code, Octave being a, an open source small version of MATLAB. But uh, if, again, if many people, if, if it seems that many people would like to do uh, Lua or, or whatever, or use this or that library, we would definitely consider to add it in the, 